So um, I was talking to some of my friends back in Philadelphia, my, my friends back in Philadelphia, and I was talking a little bit about um, Julie's book and that we had her coming here and that the title of the book was How to Raise an Adult, and their comment was, wouldn't it have been nice if your parents had had access to that book? So other than the, the gratuitous swipes that it that has caused for me, uh, we're thrilled to have Julie Lishcott Haynes here with us this morning to talk about parenting and raising particularly teenagers, but obviously uh, children of all ages, um, and, and to help us think about what that looks like. And I, I do want to acknowledge um, Dr. Pat Whiteley, uh, who is also a Gulliver parent and is the uh, Vice President in Charge of Student Affairs at the University of Miami, who helped to set this up for us. Uh, she called me over the summer and said, we have this really exciting opportunity coming together uh, where we'll have Julie at, at UM and we'd like to have uh, her come to Gulliver as well. And I said, absolutely, we would love that. So um, our, our uh, thanks to Pat for that. When I was first a school administrator, there was a, a book that was around uh, that was called The Blessings of a Skin Knee by Dr. Wendy Mogul, uh, which was sort of the, the parenting book of, of a different era in some ways. Uh, but it was basically talking about allowing students to have the, the sense of um, uh, independence and the sense of confronting adversity on their own and learning how to deal with it themselves. And it was a book that we frequently recommended and used and referenced in our discussions with parents about how they could be um, very supportive parents but allow their children to develop uh, strength and resilience. And I was talking to Julie about that, and, and she actually is partnering in, in many ways with Dr. Mogren. And, and I don't know if she'll talk about that much today or not, but um, there, there is this long tradition of trying to, um, for all of us as parents, trying to negotiate that balance of um, allowing our students, our children, to have experience of, of their own and learn how to um, deal with things that happen in the course of a day, a week, a, a life. Um, so that they develop those skills. But at the same time, as parents, we also want to try and help them through some of those things. And it's, it's a delicate line to find. Um, and so, you know, my children, are, as you know, are 28 and 26, and in some ways I've done my damage. Uh, and, uh, you know, that they still, they still love me. And uh, I'm happy about that. And, um, you know, we, we all do the best that we can. And so it's, it's good to take these moments to step back and think about just What's the process of, of parenting? What does it look like? What are some different ideas? How can we think about the work that we do with our own children? And for us as a school, how can we support you and work in, in partnership with you to provide the kinds of experiences and the kinds of support and uh, the, the sense of independence that, that your children and our students need to be able to develop into really um, fully functioning adults? Uh, so it's, it's an exciting question. It's a difficult question. Um, and and uh, Julie comes with uh, the idea of being um, hopefully provocative and inspirational to help us all uh, think a little more deeply and uh, have some conversations and, and move this question forward for ourselves. So um, I'll, I'll read you her sort of um, more official introduction because it, it's, it's good to understand the, the reference point that she comes from and then I'll, I'll let uh, clearly Julie take over. So. In How to Raise an Adult, Julie Lipscott Haynes draws on research, on conversations with admissions officers, educators, and employers, and on her own insights as a mother and as a student dean to highlight the ways in which overparenting harms children, their stressed out parents, <coughs> and society at large. While empathizing with the parental hopes and especially fears that lead to overhelping, Lipscott Haynes offers practical alternative strategies that underline the importance of allowing children to make their own mistakes and develop the resilience, resourcefulness, and inner determination necessary for success. Relevant to parents of toddlers as well as of 20-somethings and of special value to parents of teens, this book is a rallying cry for those who wish to ensure that the next generation can take charge of their own lives with confidence and confidence. Julie Lipscott Haynes serves as the Dean of Freshmen served as the Dean of Freshman and Undergraduate Advising for more than a decade at Stanford University, where she received the Dinklespiel Award for her contributions to undergraduate experience. A mother of two teenagers, she has spoken and written widely on the phenomenon of helicopter parenting, and her work has appeared on TEDx Talks and in Forbes and the Chicago Tribune. She is pursuing an MFA in creative writing at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. 
So it's my great pleasure to introduce Julie Liskotny. Thank you, Frank. Let's give um, your head of schools uh, a big round of applause. I'm really grateful to you for bringing me here today. And to Dr. Pat Whiteley, who's a great partnership with Gulliver um, as a vice provost, vice president at UM, um, is so essential to both the university and to Gulliver, I think, in communities where um, the local university takes an interest in what's happening in K through 12, our communities are so much stronger and our children benefit through their education and through uh, greater mentorship and greater opportunity. So it's really delightful to be here at Gulliver and um, to be headed over to UM this afternoon for a parents and family weekend. Uh, I get to be at Kane for an afternoon, which I'm really excited about. So thank you. I also want to acknowledge that my, um, my speaking agent, Scotty Bowditch, uh, has come down from New York to be here as well because she has a daughter who's at uh, University of Miami. So um, <coughs> nice to have you here as well, Scotty. I also want to thank Books and Books. Katsina over there has got some books to sell. <laughs> so um, I've written this book, How to Raise an Adult. And if you like anything that I say today, I hope you will consider uh, checking it out. And, um, and I'll be signing books at the end. So um, those I have mentioned, um, already had some intrinsic interest in my visit, but the rest of you are strangers to me. And I just want to say thank you for giving up a Friday morning to come here for whatever reason. I really thank you for being here. I know you could be other places. You have plenty of other things to be doing, and yet you're here. You've invested some time in coming to hear what I have to say. And I just want to say I appreciate it. Like you, I'm a parent. Like you, I'm just trying to ensure that my kids are healthy and successful. Like you, I struggle. Like you, I worry and wonder and wish. We are in this together as parents and educators, all of us. So thank you for being here. I do appreciate it. Now normally at any event such as this, we would say, put away your phones. But if I may humbly say so, with my new book, How to Raise an Adult, I aim to start a movement to try to push the parenting pendulum back in the other direction, away from raising kids to be completely dependent upon us for protection, accustomed to our constant direction, and reliant upon us for help, and toward raising independent adults for their sake, for our sake, and for the sake of us all. And if the movement's not to be televised, as they used to say back in the day, then at least it can be socialized. So please use your phones. If you're on Facebook, head over to my books page, How to Raise an Adult, and like it. Take a picture of yourself with a book, if you choose to get one, and post it. And if you're on Twitter, our handle is at Raise an Adult. You can live tweet this event or tweet about it after. And if you're not a social media user, that's okay. Please put away that phone and make eye contact with me. That's a precious resource these days, and I will cherish that too. So we're here on this lovely morning. And being from California, just the moisture in the air, it's such a treat. We're in the middle of a drought, and you guys are like, yeah, that's not our problem. <laughs> We're here on this lovely Miami morning to discuss my book, How to Raise an Adult, which, with its publication three months ago, has branded me as somewhat of a parenting expert. But to be frank, I'm not so sure how I feel about this. I mean, I didn't set out to be a parenting expert. And for that matter, I'm not particularly interested in parenting. No. And now some of you are wondering, well, what the heck am I here for then? I thought she was going to talk about parenting. I got dragged here on a perfectly wonderful Friday morning to hear a talk on parenting, some of you are thinking. But even at the risk of your continued confusion for a moment or two, I'll say it again. I'm not interested in parenting per se. What I'm interested in, actually, is human beings. You see, I believe in humans. I believe in all of us. I believe in you. I believe in myself. I believe in you way over there in the back. I believe in all of us making our way in the world. And I believe this not only for the sake of each individual, but for the sake of us all. I believe the world needs each one of us to figure out who we are, what we're good at, what we love, what we value, and then to work very, very hard to be the best version of that self we can muster. From my work with countless young adults, I've learned that having the courage 
to actually be who we are, regardless of what other people say or want, even parents, is the path to a meaningful and rewarding life. And so, I'm interested in what gets in the way of each of us being our best self, in the obstacle. And I'm interested in trying to do something about it. Now, I used to think the obstacles stemmed chiefly from otherness, outsiderness, from being on the margins in life, perhaps due to family background, demographic, status, circumstance. And yes, of course, those things can be obstacles, sometimes tremendous obstacles, to a person's chances for becoming their best self. When I was freshman dean at Stanford, I presumed that students who would most need a caring, thoughtful dean would be students from those backgrounds. Someone who might need to believe in them and support them <coughs> when their background and family narrative collided with all that Stanford would ask and expect of them. And yes, some of my favorite moments as dean were indeed spent mentor mentoring such students. So, since I was expecting that the students who would most need my help as freshman dean would be the other, however we might think of that population. Imagine how surprised I was to discover among my more affluent students a growing number who seemed to lack the ability to make their way independently in the world, as frankly 18 to 22 year olds used to be able to do and just as crucially used to desire to do, to hunger to do. And I'm deliberately being a bit vague right now about what exactly was missing in more and more of my students each year because frankly, I couldn't quite tell at first. Something was just odd, off. It took me most of my 10 years as a freshman dean before I figured out what the problem was. For starters, each year my students were more and more and more and more accomplished. They had done so, so much in childhood. You know what I mean? Let's face it, you know exactly what I mean. The right school, such as this one. But not just the right school, the right classes, the right school, and the right grades, in the right classes, and the right school. But not just that, the scores. And not just the grades and the scores, but the accolades and the awards, and the sports, and the activities, and the leadership. Don't just join a club, start a club. Colleges want to see that. And not just leadership, but not just grades and scores and sports and activities, but community service. And, 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 all done to some hoped for level of perfection. Yes, my students were seemingly more and more accomplished each year. Yet each year I noticed that more and more could tell you what they'd done, but not so much why they had done it. Could tell you what they'd achieved, but not so much what mattered to them inside, these students, and it was a segment of my student body, not all, but a growing number each year. These students were far more interesting to look at on paper than to talk with in person. Was any of this stuff really their passion, or was it just something someone said they needed to have, passion, in order to get to the quote unquote right college? Did they have a budding sense of self, or were they just content to let their parents plan life, do life, for them? Did they think a B really was failure? Or were they just saying so? And why was it so hard for them to cope with it? I believe in humans and seeing pro many promising young adults sort of walking a path of someone else's making, already a little burned out, kind of old before their time, perplexed me. Now as this was going on, each year brought more and more and more and more parents who came with their kids to college and stayed. <laughs> Sometimes literally, but more often virtually, to ask questions, select courses, activities, majors, internships and careers, solve problems, handle conflict, defend and advocate for their student, register for classes, fill out applications, track deadlines, and call to wake them up. <laughs> and to top it all off, the students associated with those parents weren't mortified as I would have been at 18 or 20, and I'm sure many of you would have been. They weren't mortified. They were grateful. They communicated with a parent multiple times a day, in the dorm, in the dining hall, in the student union, going to class, going to another class, going somewhere after class, in the lobby of the advising office, even in my office, where they tried to. It's my mom, they'd say, sheepishly, with a shrug. 
you mind if I just, mom? I believe in humans, so I thought to myself, something's not right. Is this college or middle school? <laughs> How many of you remember the movie The Stepford Wives? Anyone? Very few, huh? Okay, it was a 1975 movie, a feminist allegory of women who were not actually human, but instead were robots programmed by their husbands to be the paradigmatic perfect wife. That movie came to mind as I watched my students live their college lives, still somehow looking over to the sidelines for mom or dad's direction, protection, or intervention, as if they were five playing soccer and needing a parent to point in which direction to kick the ball. I began wondering, are we raising Stepford children? Of course, closeness, affection, love, frequent communication, that's all good. Who among us wouldn't wish for a closer relationship with our own parents? I'm a member of Gen X, the latchkey generation. So this kind of constant communication between parent and adult child at first seems so cute to me. But when the dynamic between parent and adult child is this constant chatter about choices and possibilities and outcomes, the should and shouldn'ts of life, the want to's and the ought nots, the how do I do this and the let me take care of that for you's, when it came to all manner of their academic, professional, emotional, and personal lives, this intertwinedness moves, in my view, from a cute family picture to a somewhat disfigured portrait of a chronologically adult man or woman student, incapable of fending for themselves. Such students were not only talking about the joys of life and big life decisions with their parents, which I think is quite natural and appropriate, they turned to a parent whenever something went even mildly wrong. A flat tire, an argument with a roommate, less than great on an assignment, as if their first instinct was not to go within to contend with it and cope and think it over, but to call or text a parent, an instinct as natural for them as taking a breath of air, and as essential. And mom or dad were right there with the assist. These students didn't seem to know how to contend with what life would throw their way, the normal stuff of life, how to sit with their discomfort or indecision or opportunity and emerge with their own sense of how they might handle it, and then to seek some advice and guidance from capable others. So intertwined with their own parents, they didn't seem to know how to be, in italics, be their own selves. As a believer in humans, that's what made me worry for the future of these students. And even our future as a species, which I'll say, and I believe me, I know it sounds sort of hysterical, but when you work with thousands of the so-called best and bright, and you see that a growing number of them seem to suffer from a kind of existential impotence, as I call it. And then you speak with colleagues at schools around the country, not just the elite schools, but schools in every tier, public and private, every region, and they're seeing this. And you realize this isn't just a Stanford thing or a Bay Area thing, but a middle and upper middle class American thing nationwide. And you see that the rates of mental health problems in children and adolescents and young adults are at the same time soaring particularly in affluent communities, and then you read employers saying, what is it with these 20-somethings? They just want to be told what to do and to be applauded for doing it. They can't think for themselves in the workplace, take the initiative, roll up their sleeves, pitch in. When you learn all of this and you care about humans, you get concerned, really concerned. And that concern is what made me write How to Raise an Adult a book on, well, as it turns out, parenting. <laughs> What's going on with parenting, I asked myself. And I gotta tell you, I was mortified to discover the answer staring back at me in the mirror one day. Every fall at freshman orientation, I got to give a talk to parents. The purpose of the talk was to embrace parents, empathize with the big transition they were making, and give some pretty direct advice. I'd say, trust your kid is capable of handling this. They've gotten here. Trust that they've got what it takes. Trust the institution. We're not trying to do as little as we can get away with. We're trying to do as much as we possibly can to educate these young people. Trust your kid, trust the institution, now go home, was basically my message. 
I never actually wagged my finger at my students' parents, but inside I was thinking, come on, folks, back off. This is college now, not your college experience, theirs. Go away. Well, in 2009, the day after giving that annual speech, I came home from work. I had been working really late in preparation for orientation, been away night after night preparing for other people's kids to come to the university. So I'm finally at home with my own kids. They were eight and 10 at the time. I'd had dinner the night before with parents of Stanford freshmen, kind of wagging my finger at them. The next night, I'm at dinner with my own family. I sit down, husband, two kids, and I reached over and began cutting my 10-year-old son's meat. <laughs> oh, some of you are thinking, so? What's wrong with that? And it was like, all of a sudden, I was being visited by Dickens' ghost of Christmas future or something. If you want your kid to be independent at 18 at some point, you have to stop cutting their meat. I sat up straight and I asked myself, well now when do you stop cutting their meat? When do you stop looking both ways for them as they cross the street? When do you stop helping with the homework? When do you let them talk to strangers? I realized I was still treating my 10 year old like little kids. They never went anywhere alone. They did no chores. They had no responsibilities. I praised every little thing and tried to ensure the path in front of them was as lovely and smooth as possible. One day earlier, I had been tisk tisking my students' parents about not letting go of their college age sons and daughters, only to realize I was fostering tremendous dependence in my own kids with no end to that in sight. Was I, after all these years of being concerned about those parents, was I in danger of being one of those parents who couldn't let go when my kids got to college? Who, me? Very humbling. That night, I realized I'd been given this rare gift of seeing the results of thousands of upbringings and childhoods in the form of other people's grown-up sons and daughters. Why was childhood no longer preparing kids for independent adulthood? Why were college students and 20-somethings now referring to themselves as kids, as they began doing in the last decade? How would my generation pass the mantle of leadership on to such adults? How the heck am I and countless other parents getting it so wrong? Because it's not as if we're not trying. God knows we are trying so very hard to get this right. For a bit of perspective, Let's go back for a few moments to how it all began with our infant. In the beginning, our love is our umbilicus, our heartbeat, our body. And then it is our arm, our kiss, our breast. We bring them home to a sheltering roof and we delight weeks later when they make that first intentional eye contact with us. Remember? We nurture early babbles into first words and applaud as they gain strength to roll over and sit up and crawl. And we scan the horizon of the 21st century and see an increasingly interconnected and competitive world that at times seems utterly familiar and at times utterly not. And we gaze down at our precious little ones with a promise to do all we can to help them make their way into the long life that lies ahead. There's no amount of direction on our part that force them to stand or walk before they are ready. So we watch, wait, clap. And when they fall, we don't say, what's wrong with you? We expect more from you. You're closing doors on your future. <laughs> Instead, of course, we encourage. If you think about it, when they're learning to stand and walk, maybe the last time, we actually believe in falling, in failure as the essential teacher, the builder of a human's capabilities, strength and resilience. We see almost instantly that they're their own little person, but we want them to start where we left off, to stand on our strong shoulders, to benefit from all we know and can provide, and rightly so. We expose them to experiences, ideas, people, and places that we think will help them learn and grow and thrive. We want them to reach and be stretched by the kind of rigor and opportunity that will maximize their potential and their chances we're sure we know best what it takes to succeed in today's world, high GPA, test scores, admissions to the right colleges and universities, 
and we're quite eager to protect and direct them and be there for them at every turn, whatever it takes to achieve those outcomes. We mean so incredibly well by this, but in communities like ours, doing whatever it takes as a parent has come to mean what I call the checklist in childhood. All the things our kids must experience and achieve in order to gain entry to the right schools and a specific set of careers and achieve ultimately that definition of success that we have in mind. And in furtherance of that, the checklist in childhood means everything is safe, selected, chosen, recommended, planned, decided, approved, improved, done, accomplished, handled, coached, figured out, fixed, arranged, solved, resolved, absolved, shaped, designed, orchestrated, and dreamed for them. Then we hover over our kids as they check off all the items on the checklist. We keep them safe and sound and fed and watered. And when we see an obstacle in their path, we try to remove it all the while encouraging them along toward that GPA, all those APs or IBs, the higher scores, accolades and awards, nudging, cajoling, hinting, helping, haggling, nagging, as the case may be, to be sure they're not screwing up, not closing doors, not ruining their future, calling for help when needed in the form of tutors, coaches, specialists, handlers, extra spiffy coaches and handlers to improve the child in front of us. We say we just want them to be happy, but when they come home, what we tend to ask about first is their homework and their grades, and they see in our faces that approval and love and worth, their worth comes from taking more APs and getting A's, and when that work is hard, we stand ever closer, running alongside with clucking praise, like a trainer at the Westminster Dog Show, coaxing them to jump ever farther and soar ever higher, arguing and contending with the rule makers when they fall or fail, forcing them back on the path, using our own strength to boost their effort. They are breathless at the end of this childhood. Their ears are tired of the constant drone. Our chirps are perfect, great job. Rhetorical ticks devoid of meaning, and we commend them to our friends and the stickers on the backs of our cars. <laughs> and we also commend ourselves. Look what we've done. We did this amazing science project. <laughs> we got an A on this essay. I can't believe the teacher gave us a B. <laughs> us. We've got a 3.978 GPA. We got this SAT or ACT score. We're applying to college. We're gonna be a cane. Right? Recognize any of that? I sure do. Communities all over the country where parents have some disposable time and income to invest in really trying to be there in every conceivable way for our kids, this is what it looks and feels like. We are constantly there doing everything and every little thing for them. And when I finally connected the dots between that dinner with parents of Stanford freshmen and what was happening at dinner at my own house, I realized parents can't just magically let go of their 18-year-old on the front door of the college on the first day if they've been holding tight to their 17-year-old, and so on. Childhood is meant to provide opportunities for them to gain more and more skills and independence to try and to fail, and to try to fail, and to try again, to learn to do and think for themselves, and childhood would, if only we'd let it, but we don't. We're so afraid if they fall or fail, they won't get into college, or we're afraid we'll look bad, or both. But this omnipresent over-involvement of parents means kids grow to be chronologically adults, but remain a bit stunted, as I saw in more and more of my undergraduates each year, dependent on parents to do not only the planning, deciding, implementing, figuring out, problem solving, handling, and coping of life, but reliant upon parents to do the lovely, light, the lovely, light, ethereal dreaming as well. Look, my book is called How to Raise an Adult but it could just as easily have been called the road to hell. <laughs> because we planned and paved and protected our child's perfect path with the very best of intentions. But if you look at what we've done, if you have the courage to really examine it, 
You see that when we've walked so closely alongside our kids, when we've not only told them what to do with their lives, but how to do it, when we do the work for them when they struggle, and even when they aren't struggling, we just overhelp to ensure they get that extra edge, when we push, 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 when we make them study a certain thing, shape their dreams, tell them who they must be to make us proud, we've actually undermined our kids' chance to make their own way. Not only do they not have life skills when they grow up, how to earn and save money, how to fill out forms, how to remember their own stuff, wake themselves up, talk to a landlord, pump gas, but they haven't been allowed to become who they might have wanted to become. Too many playwrights and poets are forced into STEM. A teenager commits suicide and his obituary includes his ACT score. And you know what the worst part of this is? Besides how arrogant it is to force someone else's life path in a particular direction, how unethical it is to do their schoolwork, how cruel it is to be a constant crutch that will not always be able to be there for them, how harmful it is to make them feel that our love is conditioned on admission to a certain school, the worst part, unintended yet insidious, that results when we live right up inside their heads all the time, is that they get this message, kid, I don't think you can do this without me. Trying to boost them up, paradoxically we're tearing them down. We overhelp so as not to disadvantage them, yet they are disadvantaged because we do so much. You're not good enough for this life as you are, is sort of a message they get, you never will be. You can't make your own decisions, be trusted with the task of being successful in life. You need me to direct and guide you. You will always need me. This is the message that starts to pour into their developing minds and hearts and souls. Look, I believe in humans and I have to tell you, I think we're smothering the life, the very sense of self out of our kids, our precious children. Our job as parents is to put ourselves out of that job and raise our offspring to independence. Yes, we gave them life, but life is to be lived in order for them to become the beautifully unique individual they are, we have to let them become that person. We've succeeded as parents if our adult children can fend for themselves. And fend means, I looked it up, it means provide for oneself without any help from others, not call your parents and see if they can fend for you. The best-selling author and psychologist Madeline Levine, author of Teach Your Children Well and The Price of Privilege, says, we shouldn't do what our kid can already do for themselves, can almost do for themselves, because that's where the learning happens, or those things that are just in furtherance of our own ego as parents. We're supposed to want this skill building, this independence for them, but these days we seem somewhat sickly engaged by their need to constantly need us, a need, remember, that we manufactured. We've got to back off and let our kids do more and more for themselves if we are to have any hope that they'll have the wherewithal to be an adult who can fend for themselves one day, maybe look after us one day, maybe raise their own kids one day. I didn't even know what wherewithal to be an adult meant when I first noticed it was missing in some of my students. When I went looking, it was hard to find a list of skills a human adult is supposed to have, but then I found a gold mine in the special needs community where parents and educators have to be deliberate about teaching life skills because the disability might otherwise get in the way. My friend Stacy Ashland, who has one kid with special needs and another developing typically, teaches both of her kids life skills this way. She says whatever the skill is, number one, it's a four-step method. Number one, first you do it for them. Number two, then we do it with them. Number three, then we watch them do it. Number four, they do it completely on their own. First you do it for them, then you do it with them, then you watch them do it, then they do it completely on their own. It applies to learning across the street, making a meal, putting the homework in the backpack, filling out taxes. We have to teach them to do for themselves, not only for our kids' sake, but for our own. I've said to you a number of times that I believe in humans, and guess what? That includes all of us parents, too. Many of us spend our lives scheduled to the hilt between work and home, homework and homeroom, practice tests and practice fields, trying to keep up with the judgmental Joneses. Ours is an endless shuffle to a rehearsal, a practice, a tutoring session, an expert of some kind designed to make our kid better, 
something. We are on autopilot in our minivans, going through the motions, making the snacks, being on the committees, arguing with teachers, principals, coaches, and referees, serving as our kids' concierge, personal assistant, and secretary, fearing our spouse, vaguely wondering when we'll get off the sidelines of soccer practice and start living our own life again. Our morning medication is caffeine. Our evening medication is wine. And long, long, long gone are the days of throwing open the back door and saying, get out there and play. I'll call you for dinner. There are few wide open doors or afternoons for that matter in childhood today. and Very few kids are home to play. If you're a boomer or a Gen Xer, that's history. If you're a millennial, it sounds like fiction. No, there's no time for that. No room in the afternoon. There's only the schedule and the drop off and the pickup and some semblance of that family dinner we all know we're supposed to have and then the homework until some set of us plus them is exhausted. Sleep. Repeat. When I was writing How to Raise an Adult, a mom in my community in Palo Alto pulled me aside at a meeting and pleaded. When did childhood get so stressful, she asked me. I put my hand on her shoulder and as tears slowly filled her eyes, a second mother who had overheard began walking toward us, nodding, and then she leaned in and asked, Julie, do you know how many moms in our community are medicated for anxiety? I didn't know the answer to either question, but a growing number of conversations like this with parents like these became another reason to write the book. I believe in humans, I believe in all of us. And I guess you could say that my role as a college dean afforded me a view of the future that frightened me. And I'm now running back to warn you, warn all of us who are still raising kids, that this overly protective, overly directive, overly hand-holding way of parenting, done with the best of intentions, is harmful to kids, to parents, and to us all. I'm here with this book and this rhetoric and this book tour and some kind of authority that comes from it all, but I don't think you really needed me to say any of this to you. You know it. We all know it. We hear about 20-somethings, even 30-somethings, failing to launch, lacking the life skills to live on their own or get a job, behave as adults even when they are living at home with their parents as adults. We see our children withering under the pressure of the checklisted childhood. We feel ourselves struggling to do all that parents do these days to ensure the checklist is adhered to. We remember our own freer childhoods lived not that long ago, and we imagine a different, saner way for our own kids and ourselves, perhaps elsewhere. I don't know, Wyoming? <laughs> Yet we look over our shoulder and we see the galloping herd of other parents who are constantly hovering over their kids, cultivating them like precious little bonsai trees, spending more money, hiring more help, taking more time off to ensure their kid makes the grade, makes the cut, gets admitted to that school over our kid, bragging about their outcomes. We want to trust our instincts as parents, wish we were brave enough to step away, focus on family time, not test prep, insight, laughter at home, prompt joy, let our kids just be kids a little bit. But we fear the herd and the short-term win their kid will achieve with all that help. Even when we know we know better, the over-parenting herd is like a bully. We feel the need to go along with lest we be hurt by it even further. Look, we love our children with a driving force, an aching, fierce, terror joy we can barely comprehend. It is the most humbling and precious bewildering task to try to raise another human, isn't it? 10 years ago, when I wrote my first piece on the harm of overparenting, I was just a college dean and a mom with a whole lot of compassion for young adults and a mounting concern that something was just not right. Now, 10 years later, there's abundant evidence from study after study in the field of psychology that our overprotection, overdirection, and excessive handholding harms kids deprives them of building life skills, renders them less capable in a workplace that wants them to take the initiative and pitch in, and leads to much higher rates of anxiety and depression. According to a very recent study of 100,000 college students on 153 campuses, including all the biggest brand names and the biggest universities and colleges and many others you haven't heard of, 
153 schools, 100,000 students. 84.3% said they were overwhelmed by all they had to do. 60.5% were very sad. 57% were very lonely. 51.3% felt overwhelming anxiety. 46.5% felt things were hopeless. That's almost half the kids. Remember, this was from all over. Tiers one, two, three, large universities, small colleges, east, west, north, south. It's not just those who get into and attend the most highly selective and elite schools. There's an unhealthy amount of something, pressure and stress, narrow expectations in childhood itself today, everywhere. My book tour is taking me all over the country and I've now had numerous conversations with high school students. It's, in a, it's usually in an assembly and what happens is I tell them, I talk with them and then I say, I'll be talking to the parents in this community tonight. And so I say to them, what would you have me tell parents to do or not to do or do differently, if you could? One visit was to Forsyth County, Georgia, a community very much like this one. I asked this question, what would you have me tell parents tonight? And there was silence. It's always awkward to stand up in front of a set of high school students that you have no connection to. They can dismiss you in a second. So I worked hard to create that connection, and I thought I had, but there was silence. So I asked again, reassuring them that it, it would be anonymous. What would they share? Would they pass through me to a set of parents? Silence. And at this point, I'm super nervous, thinking I'm about to fail up here on this stage. And then I said, look, I realize you might not want to share because you're worried about what your friends will think but I promise you there are other people in this auditorium who are feeling the same thing. Then one kid raised his hand and stood up and he said, would you tell our parents that the brand name of the college we go to isn't as important as they think? 10 seconds ago, I couldn't get a single one of those kids to say anything, but then after this kid spoke up, the entire room burst into applause. Then they opened up, more and more of them. They said things like, Please don't care so much about every little thing. They said, it's scary, I put pressure on myself. I don't need more from you. They said, I don't have a social life, but I need one. They said, you don't always hear us. They said, start believing in me and not comparing me to others. The mother in me just ached when they said this. And I hear this kind of thing from kids wherever I go. We can and must do better. Look, there's a lot that's wrong in society, larger forces that both constrain and impel us as parents, such as the myth promulgated by US News and others that there are only a handful of colleges that offer a great education where we could be proud to send our child. But let's not forget that we have a tremendous amount of control of what I call the local, local level of our kitchen counter and our dining table, where we've got children who will need dinner tonight and breakfast tomorrow morning. Join me in doing right by our children, by leaving the herd of hoverers, by fostering independence and skills, not dependence, by pulling back our blinders and looking at a greater number of colleges, and by supporting our kids and being who they are, rather than telling them who and what to be. Together, I believe we can push the parenting pendulum back in the other direction, away from overprotected, overdirected, handheld, anxiety and depression riddled forever children, and toward raising healthy, happy, successful adults. Thank you. Okay guys, so we got appreciate that. Thank you for that a little bit of time. And would love to take your questions or comments. They're too afraid to ask. Yes, this gentleman's got a comment or a question. Please tell me your first name. Fred. Fred? Jock. Jock. Fred Jock. Fred Jock? Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, I agree 100% with everything you said, but the problem there is, is according, um, like probably a lot of us here, we are foreigners, and what we've heard since we moved to America is if you don't come from the right college and if you don't come with this good diploma, your chances of making it happen are zero. It is not true. I think the evidence is not true. <laughs> this is what Fred Jock has said, we, many of us are foreigners, we come to this country and we hear you have to go to the right college and if you don't, you won't be successful in life. There's so much wrong with that mindset. It is very prevalent and it is wrong. Okay? The evidence is right here in this room that 
successful, happy people leading meaningful, leading meaningful and rewarding lives didn't all go to the quote unquote top colleges. I go quote unquote because our sense of what a top college is is also really skewed and problematic. Um, as an educator, I know, and the educators in the room know, that a high quality college experience is had where faculty are motivated to teach undergraduates. And that happens at our biggest, most well-known universities, but it also happens at small little colleges no one has heard of, okay? There are 2,800 four-year schools in the United States that are accredited, and a lot of community colleges and junior colleges as well, and of course, amazing schools outside the US. But just looking at the 2,800 here in the US, I like to say that I'd wager that as with anything, the top 5% are probably magnificent and worth your attention. That's 140 schools. They're all selective in some sense. They don't admit everybody. But their admissions rates are far more favorable. They're not this cutthroat 5, 7, 10, 12% admission. Okay? Malcolm Gladwell has said, he wrote Tipping Point Outliers, his newest book, David and Goliath. And David and Goliath, Malcolm Gladwell says, it's actually advantageous for a student to go to a school one tier below the best school they've been admitted to, to just adopt that best school paradigm for a second. So if you've been admitted here, it's more advantageous to go here because the students who are the best wherever they go are the ones that get more access to faculty, the goodies at the college or the university, more research, special opportunities. You want to be big fish, small pond. You want to be a top student at your college or university, not to go to a huge, highly selective, big brand name place and be in the bottom 50 or 80% of the class. Because it's the people who do the best wherever they go that have the greatest number of doors of opportunity open to them in the world of work or grad school. So there are a lot of reasons. There's a final piece of data I'll give you, studied by two guys, Kruger and Dale, many years ago. Looked at students who had the grades and scores to get into the most highly selective places but didn't go there. Let's face it, at a place like Stanford, for example, they got 44,000 applications last year for 2,200 spots. And this, the admissions dean has said tens of thousands of the applicants had what it took in terms of their high school track record, their intellectual capabilities, their potential. Tens of thousands could have been admitted, but they don't have the room. Well, the good news there is, according to Kruger and Dale's research, if you had what it took, if you had the grades and scores to get into one of those places, but you were one of many thousands that didn't get in, and you go somewhere else, your life outcomes financially 20 years later are no different. In other words, it's the kid, not the school. If your student has the motivation and intrinsic motivation to work hard and make something of themselves, it's not the school that will make them, it's, it's the kid, okay? So that's the answer. I would say sit, relax a little bit, be willing to look at more options. Don't make your kid feel that their worth and value is conditioned upon admission to some place that's admitting a tiny, tiny number. They feel like failures when they don't. You wanna be, you know, if that's what they want and they get in there, you can be happy that they do. But why steer their whole childhood toward that sort of really unlikely outcome when there are so many wonderful schools that have much more favorable admissions rates? Look, I'm a graduate of Stanford. There was, a, my husband is too. There was a time I thought, well, why would I want my kids to go anywhere else? But then I really began to appreciate the admissions stats. I was talking to an admissions dean at Smith College, which is a women's college in Northampton, Massachusetts, near Holyoke, Amherst, UMass Amherst, and, Ham and Hampshire. She goes out and gives talks in her community about applying to college, Common App, financial aid, what concept of the right college to apply to. And she said, look folks, if there's a five just to 10% chance of rain, do you take an umbrella? No. Do you take your raincoat? They, one man says five to 10% chance, that's not gonna rain. You don't take your umbrella, you don't take your raincoat. Why then do we think that when there's a five to 10% chance of admission to a particular college, somehow those odds will be in our kids' favor? Okay, when Sid said this to me, Sidonia Dalby, Sid, she goes by and Smith, said this, I was like, oh my gosh, I get it. My kids aren't gonna get in there, nobody gets in. I don't want, I'm not gonna focus their entire childhood on that outcome and the great likelihood of disappointment, okay? I'm gonna look at a broader set of options. Help my kid find a place with a, where they feel a great sense of fit and belonging. I know as a freshman dean, you wanna feel as a student, you belong there. You're challenged in the right ways, but also your people are there, you know, your community, you can be yourself. We want them to feel not coddled, 
We want them to be stretched, but we want them to feel, you know, this is my place. Four years is a long time in the life of a developing human. We want them not just to be okay there and like, well, it was a great brand name, I'm glad it's on my diploma, but I thrived there, okay? That's my very long-winded answer to that really important question. Thank you, Red Jaw. Yes? Tell me your name. Adriana. Adriana. <laughs> Adriana says, "What's the what is the goal of going to school? Going the goal of life or the goal of going to school?" Well, the goal of school. Is it, obviously, we say get into college. Or we're, right. We're sending them to school so they get into college. Right. But what is the other message that we're trying to convey to our kids? What would you say is the goal for being? So what I would say to kids as the goal for being in school is. Education is an opportunity to develop the self. It's an opportunity to grow intellectually. It's an opportunity to understand who you are, what matters to you, what values you have, and to figure out how to apply your, to develop your skills further and apply those skills um, to your passions and your values and craft meaningful work in life accordingly. Um, so I think of education in the broadest sense as um, enhancing the human. Um, toward greater purpose and utility in life for their sake as an individual and their family and to contribute to society, to become a good productive citizen who won't only think about their own selves and their own circumstance, but to have a broader perspective. Now these are the things we want for our kids, particularly in a 21st century global society. <coughs> School has become this very utilitarian thing. You've gotta to go to college. We often don't talk about the why behind it. When I talk to high school students, what I say is, look, we're steering you down this narrow path toward a high GPA and the right test scores toward college, um, as, if, um, as if really that's the whole point. Um, and I say, you know, I'd like to give you a different type of checklist or things to think about. The longest longitudinal study of humans ever conducted in this country, they looked at humans over the course of the many decades of their life from college graduation to their death said that professional success in life comes from having done chores as a kid. And the sooner you start, the better. I know some of you are worried right now. <laughs> I was too. Um, and that happiness equals love, full stop. So happiness, that's a quote from the study. Happiness equals love, full stop, as in the old telegram days. And um, it boils down to work ethic, chores, pitch in, mindset, roll up your sleeves, do the stuff that has to be done, whether it's pleasant or not, whether it's the plum opportunity or not, do it. That's how you advance in the workplace, anticipate what's needed, pitch in. And love, our ability to be connected to other humans, with our primary partner, our families, our children, our friends, those are the things that lead to professional success and happiness in life. So I tell kids, number one, be kind. It sounds trite, it sounds silly, but if you can focus on being a person who is kind toward other humans, you'll be amazed at how the doors open to you. The kindness will come back to you. You know, being able to just interact with our fellow humans and with kindness is essential for success in life. Kindness, I say try hard. We tell you just be your best, honey. All I expect is that you just be your best. Well, just and be your best don't really belong in the same sentence because just means only or always. We're saying always be your best, that's all I expect. Well, none of us is always at our best. We act as if their childhoods must be perfect, even though we led flawed lives, and fell and flailed and figured things out and got ourselves back together. In fact, that's how we became who we are. We act as if somehow they should bypass all those lessons and be perfect. So I say to kids, kindness, try hard, choose a college that's right for you, and have the courage to study what you love. Because when you actually study what you love, all of you in this room who are happy right now, professionally, you are happy because your work is aligned with what you're good at and what you care about, okay? When you have the courage to study what you love, you are motivated to do all the right things that lead to the things you're looking for, like the good grades and the doors of opportunity in the workplace. When you study what you love, you go to every class, you do all the work, you do the extra work, you talk to faculty, you do research, you just become a part of that discipline. Your knowledge deepens, you make mentorship connections, when you study what you love, even if it's an impractical thing that people don't really understand, 
You know, it's growing your intellectual capacity, it's growing your creativity, it's growing your analytical skills. You know, that's when people emerge out into the world and thrive, not when they've sort of done what they thought they had to do to please somebody else or meet someone else's expectations. So that's my that's my answer there about the purpose of, of education and how to make the most of it. Yes. So you kind of indicated that there's this bullying effect. Uh, sorry, Thomas. Uh, there's a bullying effect uh, that even if you don't want to do these things as a parent, you can push in because you see everyone else. I'll repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> so she mentioned that there's this bullying effect where other, even if you don't want to do these things as a parent, you feel pushed in because it's what you see everyone else doing. Even if we resist that, what about our kids? Because these are the messages that they're giving, even if we don't impose these on them, that's what they're getting. It's almost as if this is actually a symptom of our problem and that we have a complete lack of creativity in defining what's successful. And there's almost an assumption or an idea that just because you have to have a perfect college, you also have to be on the cover of Time magazine, you're going to be a Nobel laureate, you're going to be a multi-billionaire with a with Facebook as your product, and that we really lost track of what actually is success and how do we define that. And our kids really don't necessarily have the concept of that because we don't. Right. Thank you, Thomas, for that. So there's the bullying herd, and even if we can resist them, our own kids are feeling the stress and pressure of this narrow definition of success. Be on Time Magazine, be like Mark Zuckerberg, found a company, make your billions. Um, what do we do about that? I have a number of thoughts. Um, as I said, I've got a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. I've got a freshman in high school and a junior, and then a very, I'm in Palo Alto, California, which is Silicon Valley, and you know it's a public school, and it's where everyone's expected to go to some place with a brand name, and where the average S median SAT score at my kid's high school is in the 99th percentile nationwide, but only the 75th percentile, sorry, I said that wrong. The SAT score that is the 99th percentile nationwide is only the 75th percentile of my kid's school. So in a school, they feel mediocre at that 75th percentile, even though the equivalent nationally is 99th. They feel mediocre in a community that demands excellence. So it's just terribly, terribly harrowing for them. Um, here's what I think we can do. First, we have to broaden our definition of success and not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Too often we say, oh, the college you go to doesn't matter. Then we get super excited when someone's kid goes to that school. And we just, whoa, did you hear so-and-so, son or daughter going there? And then we don't have that same enthusiasm about other schools. So we can walk the walk by just celebrating and being enthusiastic about kids going to college. You know, having confidence that they found a school that's right for them. When our kids hear us, that becomes more authentic uh, a message um, of, the, you know, there are a broad set of colleges out there, and we'd be happy for you to go to any number of them. Um, I think also we need to bring role models into their lives, people who, you know, who have had a life path that's a little off kilter in some way. Most of us had a life path, as Madeline Levine has said in her public talks, you know, that had some ups and downs to it, but our kids think of us as perfect, they look up to us. Kids today look up to parents more than any other role model. And so they think we've had this trajectory, however you want to look at the map, you know, it's, it's from your perspective, like, ooh, look who we became. We need to, you know, let them meet other people who've had a circuitous path, who've done things that we admire and value, who, and make, make something of the fact that those people didn't go to a big brand name school, you know, and then share with them our own failures, you know, the times when things went wrong for us, and how we struggled, and how we coped, you know, they need for us to model that, that failure is in fact life's greatest teacher, instead of to pretend that somehow a failure-proof life is what we're all aiming for. Um, and I think the best time to support our kids is when they're struggling. When they're struggling in a class, when they're overwhelmed with workload, when something has happened on the team or the activity, you know, that's when we can surround them with the message that, hey, you know, that didn't work out for you the way you'd hoped. You know, I love you, what do you want to do now? How can we support you? You know reinforce the fact that their worth and value in your eyes isn't about that accomplishment, that activity, that sport, that grade, but that their value actually comes from the fact that they exist. And you can signal that to them in a really simple way, I mean, in a lot of ways, but one of the things that's plaguing us these days is stuff like this. You know, our laptops and our smartphones, we're always on them, right? 
And so when your kid comes home from school and you're there, or when you come home at the end of the day and they're there, and you see your precious offspring for the first time, put down the phone, shut the laptop, look them in the eye, let them see the joy that fills your face because your child is home, because you love them. Look them in the eye and don't say, how much homework do you have? Or how'd you do on the math test? <laughs> have you studied with the SAT yet? Come on, Robert. You know, um, look at them and say, what'd you like about school today? And even if your 14-year-old daughter says lunch, <laughs> like mine often does, and you want to say, no, I mean the academic stuff, you know, the stuff that matters, listen. What was it about lunch that was so great, honey? When you actually give a damn about what they're interested in, they start to open up. If you start to ask all your questions, SAT, homework, grades, whatever, they shut down, they don't want that. They want each one of us, I don't care who you are, where you're from, what's your gender, what's your station in life, we all want to know we matter. We all want to be loved. We all want to know we're valued just because we exist. Not because we have a particular school attached to us or a title or a certain number of dollars, you know, net worth. We all need that. Our kids need that too. So actually valuing them as humans, caring when things go wrong, instead of being mortified, well, what are you going to do about that? That's a terrible grade. That's not going to get you into college. That's not the way to motivate a kid to work hard. It's, you know, let's talk about what's not going well. How can you talk to your you know, teach her about this, get some help. Uh, maybe you have too much going on. Maybe you need to pull back. But ultimately, kid, this is yours to do. I've been an eighth grader, now it's your turn. I've been an eleventh grader, now it's your turn. You can't do it for them. You think you can, but you can't. We're just trying to support the kid in being their best version of themselves. We want them to work hard, but not to grow up sort of fearful of, of not meeting our expectations. Um, so that's what I think. It's an authentic interaction with your kid, um, particularly when rough things happen. Um, in the back of my book, I have something called complicated scripts, sorry, simple scripts for complicated moments. And it's about what we can say around other parents who are very over hovery and doing everything. It's things we can say that aren't judgmental, but that articulate a philosophy. You know, when you see other parents say, well, you know, I had to take his homework to school again today. You can laugh and say, yeah, he'd probably like that if I did it too, but can't do it forever, I'm gonna, I've decided to stop because the only way he's gonna learn is if I stop bringing that home before, or that forgotten lunch or whatever it is. So there are examples about how to, how to kind of stand up in the community and start to articulate these messages, that we're not neglecting our kids, we're not lax, you know, by not bringing that forgotten homework, we're actually teaching our kid to be responsible the next time. It's really the only way. Thank you, Thomas. Next question, yes. I want to hug you. Okay. I want to hug you because I feel that our department, and we've been seeing these trends happen more and more throughout the years, and we try to tell parents and we try to explain it to them, and they hire a private college counselor because we're not telling them what they want to hear. And my, my question to you is, from a school perspective, how can we help more parents understand? Because what I'm seeing from my end, I've been doing this now for 11 years, is that the kids go away to college, they end up coming back home because it was the wrong college, because it wasn't you know, their choice, they come back stressed, a lot of them drop out, they feel like failure, the anxiety, um, suicide, and the, you know, so many mental health things yeah. that we start seeing now here. So from the school, the benefit wise, you know, because we've tried to explain it, but you know, these are you, this is usually the audience that doesn't need it, right? right. Um, the parents that are here want to learn. Right. And the parents that come to these things are the ones that you know, sometimes don't need to hear these things. So at the school, what more can we do to help prevent some of these long-term problems that we're starting to see now on your end and our end? Thank you, Adrienne, and I'll take that hug at the end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Adrienne is a college counselor here and has really seen kind of the She's seen up ahead to the future of it, what happens to kids when they've gone sort of to the place that wasn't right for them, but they did it because that was the expectation or what have you. One of the things I, so college counselors, they love kids. I interview a number of them in my book, and they're really standing at the, you know, on the front lines, and they're trying to help the process be one that is a chance for a young man or woman to come to know themselves better, 
reflect back on their high school experience, look ahead to what they might want, you know, um, you know, really tell their own story accurately and well. And too often these days, they're sort of acting as a buffer, you know, where the kid feels good about their college list, but the parents are not happy with it. The parents will say, no, 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 that's not acceptable. No, 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 I, I had them go to the school because I expected that these schools would be on the college list and so on. So I think one of the very best things, look, US News World Report has us like this or worse. And um, there are plenty of other much better lists that actually get at what is the education like there. So there's a set of schools you may have heard of called Colleges That Change Lives. What I'm saying is I would promote the heck out of other resources and just try to, parents have a narrow blinder on like this and we gotta expand, just pull the blinders back a little bit so parents can see beyond the 10 or 20 or 30 schools they think are acceptable to the 50 schools, to the 100 schools, to the 140, okay? So I'm gonna list now a few resources. Colleges That Change Lives, ctcl.org, collegesthatchangelives.org. They're called this, Lauren Pope put the list together. He was the education editor for the New York Times for years, and he put this book together um, because these were schools where uniformly the alumni said, this school changed my life. Not, it was a great brand name to have on my resume. This school changed my life. 40 schools, you haven't heard of most of them, I promise you, but you might have heard of one or two. Check them out. Small colleges where students get attention, directly from faculty, close residential communities, lots of great mentoring. They grow their minds, they grow their souls, they grow their beings, they come out, they get wonderful jobs, you know, they have a great education. There's also a new ranking system that came out this week, and dang it, I should have looked it up before I got here, but Rob Reich, the former labor secretary, just published a piece this week, and um, maybe Scott, do you have my phone? Do you have your cell phones out, Scotty? If you look up what Rob Reich just published about a new ranking system, I want to say it's in the Washington Monthly or something. Anyway, the point is, he said, let's not look at what US News and World Report does, which is the incoming grades, of the freshmen, which tells you about their, them as high school students, but doesn't tell you a lot how selective is the college. That has nothing to do with what it's like to be a student there. He's looked at a whole set of factors that really get more to the quality of the education. And um, this is where plenty of universities that aren't usually at the top of the list and plenty of colleges that aren't usually at the top of the list are coming out. So um, uh, I will try to get that, that, that other ranking system to you. As the point is, there are just, there are so many schools. You want your, here's what you want. You want your student to go off to school with a mental health and wellness such that they will be able to be a student there and thrive. And there is something about this overscheduled childhood, you know, steered toward a narrow definition of success that is messing with kids psychologically. These horrible rates of mental health difficulties are getting worse, by the way. That was a 2013 study I cited. The numbers in 2014 are worse. So with my own two kids in Palo Alto, what I decided is I want them to emerge from their amazing high school experience, rigorous as it is, with their mental health intact, with a sense of what they're interested in, and the college they want to go to that is, will allow them to further and deepen that interest. And I'm here to tell you I'd be proud to have my kids go to any one of those 140 schools that I've mentioned as the top 5%. And I feel that influential people in every community, if we start to get comfortable with that concept and start to drop the names of other colleges, some of those small colleges on the colleges that change lives list, people just are afraid, are afraid and frightened. So if people they respect start to say, oh, Carleton in Minnesota is fabulous. You know, boy, St. Olaf too. You know, what about Grinnell in Iowa? You know, whatever it is, they're fine. Check out some of these other lists. Do some research on five or seven schools, and then you can authentically say, you know what, I'd be proud to have Junior apply to this school. Your friends will hear it and they'll start to think, well maybe I can be proud of a wider set of options too. So I think it's making the options more attractive, highlighting alumni who have gone out to the world and done meaningful things where we respect and admire them and didn't go to a brand name school, bringing them back, letting them tell their wonderfully inspiring story to parents. That's what I would do. Okay, Scotty. Okay, so Google the Washington Monthly. They have a brand new ranking system, and you'll be delighted to see that the top of the list are a set of schools that, you know, it's just sort of the flip of the US News, okay? 
Brand is not broad when it comes to the quality of an education. We really shouldn't be choosing a color like we choose our jeans or our car or soda. Okay? All right. I don't know. Yes? I just have two comments. Yes. This is our bookseller. I know. Katsina. <laughs> really helpful. So, Katsina's advice, actually I'm going to comment on it twice here. Um, I always hear from employers in every single setting in which I'm fortunate to be a part, someone will raise their hand and say, I'm employing young adults and they're a disaster. Yeah. Okay, well let's put it this way. Some are fantastic and some are a disaster. And you want your kid to be on the fantastic side, not the disaster side. And if they've led a checklist of childhood where everything has been, you know, high expectations, but Everything's been planned and paved for them, and you've removed the obstacles and just had them focus on their homework and their grades and their enrichment. And you've absolved them of chores, and you've planned it all for them. They get out into the world, and they just want to be told exactly what to do. And in this world of everyone gets a trophy, applause, 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 they want to be applauded just for doing it. And that gets you nowhere in the workplace. Okay? The boss wants to see they show up a little early. They, they look around and say, hmm, what needs to be done? How can I do what they've asked, but what else can I do? How can I think two and three steps ahead to what my boss might need, anticipating? Okay, taking the initiative, anticipating, being able to think outside the box, not just follow a checklist. The checklist in childhood abrogates the development of those skills, okay? Jet Propulsion Labs, NASA, Boeing, they hire engineers. And I saw a TED talk where Stuart Brown, who's head of the National Institutes for Play, who talks about how play is the work that children do, and they're not playing freely anymore, so they're not learning to use their imagination, their creativity, think outside the box, because it's all this rich play with parents helping and watching and intervening. Stuart Brown has said, NASA, Jet Propulsion, Boeing, they don't want the top graduates from the top schools, per se. They want to hire engineers who tinkered as children. They want to hire people who had the chance to take a mound of stuff, take it apart, put it back together. Who were, that's an engineer's mindset. How does this work? What can I make? What can I make it do next? That's what they want. And instead, you know, we give them a childhood, which is a you know, Lego set that's got a set of instructions. Follow these instructions and make this destroyer, or whatever it is, instead of that big basket of a thousand Lego pieces where they can make anything they want. That's an example of the wrong kind of toy versus the right. I'm not trying to tell you to go home and throw all your toys out. I'm just telling you that we're doing too much narrow, constricted enrichment with the best of intentions, and it turns out that the wide open afternoons and the chance to play freely with other children, this matters, and this is what we've taken away from them. And to your point, Katsina, about you went to U of F and law schools were excited, I'm trying to debunk this myth that the small handful of colleges are all that matter, in this book, I've got Appendix A and B that try to give some evidence. Appendix A is the list of 171 colleges attended by the incoming class at Harvard Law School a few years back, and University of Florida is on there, as are 170 other colleges. Okay, not just the biggest brand names. Harvard Law School took people from 171 colleges. Teach for America is the second largest employer of college graduates. I don't know if you knew that. Verizon Enterprise usually buys the first and third. Teach for America is second. 
They employ 5,900 every year. They take on 5,900 new ones every year in their cohort. And um, in 2013, they pulled their 5,900 new core members from 800 colleges. We don't realize that, okay? And I list here the, the large, of the large schools, which were the schools that sent the most people to Teach for America, of the medium schools, and of the small schools. And you know, there are some schools on here you've heard of, and plenty you'll be delighted to see and you haven't heard of, okay? So these are just efforts to say, ah, folks, why the blinders? It's not what you think, it's not what you think, okay? All right, we're over time. Okay, yes, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go here, and then I'm gonna come back to you, and then we're gonna say, just because you weren't expecting to spend this much time, probably, we're gonna wrap, but then we're gonna do some book signing and selling over there if you want. Okay, so let me go to you, and then you. Okay, I would like to know your opinion on the role of society, because I feel, I'm not from this country, and I feel that it is, everything that you describe are the rules of this society, especially the American society, that race to get into college, that race to be better, competition all the time. I see kids in Mexico, Colombia, playing outside, playing with different kids. Yeah. And they go to college and they're successful with the What's your name? Anna. Anna? So the role of society, well, <laughs> we only have a few minutes, so <laughs> we don't stop on what I think about the role of society. It might take a little longer than that, but yes. And it's new. This is a new American phenomenon. And okay, this all began to be set in motion in the early 1980s when we had a confluence of four important things happening. Our fear of stranger danger was born with the murder, the abduction and murder of Adam Walsh and Eitan Katz, two well-publicized cases of child abduction, made us fear that it could happen anywhere at any time. The statistics don't bear that out at all, but nevertheless, as a nation, we became very mindful and fearful and sort of trying to plan every moment of childhood with that possibility in mind. So we became very protective around sidewalks and playgrounds and parks and malls and grocery stores in the early 80s. Number two, um, the self-esteem movement was born in the state of California and then blossomed throughout the nation. The notion that kids should get a trophy just for showing up. Certificates, ribbons, trophies, buttons, yay! And I think the only people who actually benefited from that stuff are the manufacturers of the trophies. Yeah. That have you know, the kids, so they, this is the sort of everyone gets a trophy, they expect to be applauded just for doing every little thing. And um, that was born in the early 80s. The third thing was the play date was born concept that kids don't play freely, we have to structure it, put the calendar, arrange it with the other parents, and then be there as it's happening, watch what they're doing, make sure it's enriched play, and intervene when they aren't getting along. So we've completely taken out the purpose of play in the lives of children. And the fourth thing is we had a book published called A Nation at Risk, which said if the U.S. wasn't faring very well academically, our kids weren't performing very well, we needed more testing and more teaching to the test. So all of this happened in the early 80s. A fifth thing is uh, seat belts, bike helmets became mandated by law almost in every state within a set of those years, but which was great, but that then led to knee pads on toddlers, a sense of we can sort of bumper guard, you know, bumper rails and guardrails for sort of every aspect of life. So we had parents encroaching around play and sidewalks and parks and homework and activities standing on the sidelines. We just had this encroachment of parents into domains that were previously those of children. It's not just an American thing. I'm, I'm now thrilled to say I've sold my book in China, South Korea, Brazil, Romania, UK and Australia just came out last week. Um, in many countries they will be translating and then publishing, but a number of places are saying, hey, we're doing too much of this uh, and, and our kids are underdeveloped, <laughs> underconstructed, you know, failing to launch, failing to thrive, what's to become of us. So it's not just an American thing. But yeah, it is at this societal level. And you know what I think it has a lot to do with our own people, our own egos. You know, we feel that our children are a reflection of us. And their A makes me look like a better mom. And I mentioned earlier in my talk, you know, the people that treat their child like a little bonsai tree, you know, the little tiny trees that are uh, Japanese style, they're sort of tiny little versions of their, their bigger self. And, and you clip and prune, and it's like my child, my bonsai tree, look. And we parade them around with such pride. Look at my masterpiece, my accomplishment. And I've decided my children are not bonsai trees. They're wildflowers. 
of unknown genus and species. My job is to give them the right environment so they get the nutrients they need, and I'm standing back to see who they'll become. I'm actually interested in who they are, um, not in sort of furthering my own ego, developing my child to be a brain surgeon or a you know, Supreme Court justice or what have you. You know, I want them to be kind to others and to be motivated to work hard, chores and love. Yeah, I feel like that's my job as a parent. And the rest, the schools they go to, the major, their profession, their income, I do expect them to pay their own way <laughs> in their 20s and beyond. But all of those choices they make, that's up to them. You know, my job is chores and love. What it down to. Okay, oh, we'll end with you, Fred Job, <laughs> as we can. <laughs> A couple of numbers are really failing in terms of the uh, unhappiness of the child going away at eight years old. And I think Adriana at some point mentioned that also she had that experience with kids coming, yeah. going away and coming back. Um, my, and my, my speech is that most of the kids are not really ready to leave the house at eight. And there should be a transition of two years in a local college and eventually go away very far away. <laughs> but at 20. And um, the second part of the question is, in case you agree, I think we should stay in Miami for a couple of years. What is, the, I was yesterday looking at the tuition between FIU, uh, sorry, Miami State, 3,000 a year, FIU, 8,000 a year, and you have 60,000 a year. Where is the ration? Are those dollars? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. To the question of whether kids aren't ready to go at 18, I'm really, I really struggle with this. There's a field in psychology called emerging adulthood that a lot of people are starting to buy into. And the purveyor of that theory is Jeffrey Jensen Arnett, Clark University. And one of his books is called Getting to 30, A Parent's Guide. <laughs> I just think Darwin must be rolling over in his grave when he hears that thing. No, no. So um, here's another way to look at it. Many of our young people will graduate from Gulliver Prep, whatever high school they attend, and they'll go off to a two-year, four-year college. Many other 18-year-olds will choose to serve our nation in the military. No one's saying that those 18 year olds aren't capable of making that choice and of going off to fight on behalf of the things we believe in. We're doing a lot of coddling of kids for whom college is the more attractive or likely option. But we're asking kids, primarily poor and middle class, poor and working class kids, to just go and serve in the military. So if we're gonna say that developmentally they're unready, we'd better be willing to apply that to everybody. And I don't think we are. I think what's happened is we've begun to raise kids in a way that infantilizes them. We're doing too much for them with the best of intentions. I'm doing it myself. And they end up with fewer skills than they need. They haven't done enough of the being, doing, and thinking for themselves, the planning, the coping. And so they're not ready to be a team. I agree with you that. Many of them are not ready. But here's another eye-opening statistic. In most states, children can choose to marry without parental consent at age 16 or 17. Right? You can't imagine that. That tells you how much things have changed over the years. Right? Once upon a time, the legislatures around this very diverse nation sort of uniformly felt that. Okay? Kids used to babysit at 10, 11. Now we have some laws on the books that say you're not allowed to be home alone, 12 and under. Forget taking care of other kids. I babysat other people's kids when I was 11. And I was good. You know, I was given more and more responsibility, first the daytime, and then as I proved myself, right? right? You're not, not in your head. So now we think they can't. You know, so, so I think that's why we've got to examine what are, why are we sort of raising them as if they're orchids in a little hot house and you know, carefully controlled, climate controlled? Um, there's, a, there's a superintendent in Massachusetts that says, he's a superintendent and a softball coach, and he says kids today, grown, you know, young adults are like veal. You know, veal. A young calf cultivated for the purpose of being slaughtered. Okay? 
He says they're like veal. They run home in the face of the world's slaughter. And my sense is if the world is going to try to slaughter my kids, I'm not raising veal. I'm raising warriors. You know, I want my kids to have what it takes. Yeah, the economy's tough. Yeah, the 21st century is completely unpredictable. Why pretend we're going to be here to do everything for them? We're not. If the universe unfolds as it should, we predecease them. We have to know they've got it when we're gone, which we hope isn't for a long, long time. But that day will come, and we need to know they have the skills and the habits and the mindset and the sense of self that they feel they have the wherewithal to be the adult in their own lives. That's why I've written this book, okay? To, the, to their developmental and readiness. The concept of gap year, bridge year, is growing in popularity now in the United States. The notion of a meaningful additional year, and many colleges and universities are actually partnering, are really getting on board saying if you, you do that, you can be admitted and then defer for a year through the gap year, or we'll partner with the gap year program so you do their program, then you come to our university or college, okay? You go, you do some meaningful work, Maybe you're in another country, you're living with a family. You know, you're not just having a vacation. It's not a vacation. It's a chance to sort of be in a different, uh, it's like a treadmill move from 10 to a much more thoughtful five where you're, you're working, you're existing, but you're learning. They're burned out at the end of this childhood we have constructed for them. It's a chance to take a breath, develop some skills, regroup, learn enough so that they're able to make better use of that college education a year, maybe a, a, a year, taking a year gap or a year gap. As to the cost, I can't, I don't even know where this is. Excuse me, but a win or at home? The gap? Yeah. Um, you can do it anywhere. At college or not at college? Um, like, you will pray to the Missouri at home, and then you either choose sure. from time that's all right, or you're up to I'm saying that they go to this uh, gap year that before they go to college. It's not related to credits or. No, no, no. Like yeah. If, if, they, if they want to go to college after yeah. grad grade. Yes. And they want to go, um, so they want to do like all their peers that are going to college, most of them. Yeah. But uh, what do you prefer? You should be close to home. Oh, I see. The plan of two years later sending them away to finish. Because everybody remember where you finish college. Okay. Nobody remember when you start. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. what happens. I see. That's the question. Yeah, I mean, I think there's tremendous value in actually going away from home. Um, I, went, I did that. I went 3,000 miles from, what, 2,000 miles from Wisconsin to California at 17. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, look, I can't give you a blanket answer because every kid is different. You know your son, you know your daughter, you know your family, your family's values, your expectations, what they're good at. All of that is what's relevant. You know, I think we should not be cookie cutter about this. It's like embrace the kid you have, strengthen and support the kid you have and being their best self. That's what I have to be for. All right, guys, I think we're done. Okay, thanks so much for having me.